Hi there, it's Jason Gorman from Codemanship with a bonus video for Java developers in which I'm going to be exploring the automated refactorings in IntelliJ. Uh, before we start, I just want to make it clear that I'm not sponsored by JetBrains to recommend this tool. I just happen to use it quite a lot. And in particular, I use it because of these automated refactorings. I do a lot of refactoring and I find these tools invaluable. You may not be an IntelliJ user or an Eclipse user. You might not be familiar with the automated refactoring menu, in which case, hopefully, this, this video will give you a feel for what's available and how these refactorings work, and also give you a sense of how much of the donkey work and, and the, the margin for human error it can take out of the refactoring process. Okay, now, let's start with the simplest refactoring of them all, renaming something. Now, anything that has a name in code, we can change the name of that very simply using this tool. I'm going to bring up the automated refactoring menu. And you'll see there we've got a rename refactoring in our context-sensitive menu. So we're going to rename this class. Let's call it Mars Rover. Now, when I hit Enter, to complete this refactoring, we can't just change the name here. We also have to find any references to Mars Rover and update those. And in Java, we also need to rename the file. And you see that it's already started to do that. If I just hover over there, it's already started to do that. So when I press Enter, it's going to make some suggestions. For example, would I like to rename the test fixtures? Rather smart, don't you think? Um, OK. And also, it's found all of these references, all these variables called Rover. And if I wanted to, I could rename all of those as well. That's all test code. So let's accept all of those options. Hit OK. And it will do it all in a single step. Let's rerun our tests just to prove it. So it's updated the name of the file. It's updated all the references. And it's renamed all of the variables. If we take a look inside our test code there, we're now referring to Mars Rover, which is an instance of Mars Rover. All done for us. Lovely. So that takes out a lot of donkey work. And I tend to rename stuff pretty often because the readability of code is very important. What else can we do using these tools? Well, let's say we wanted to add a parameter to this Go method on our Mars rover. Now, it's being referenced in, in many tests, and therefore we would have to then go to each of those tests and add a, a value, a parameter value being passed in, in order for this code to compile and work again. The tool takes out the donkey work. Let's use the chain signature refactoring here. If I click on plus, we get a new parameter. Let's make it a Boolean. And I'm going to call that just foo for no reason at all. And by default, so the value that by default will be passed in wherever Go is being called so that our code still works, I'm going to say, well, that should be true. Let's refactor that. And you will see as we go to our test that it's added that parameter value for foo as true. Um, we might also want to change the order of parameters or remove a parameter, or whatever we might want to do. For example, let's say we want username and password to come first. We can move the instructions parameter down the list. And when we do that, it will update all of the references to all of the calls to go. Now have admin rover123, the username and password first. So again, I will use that rather a lot as I push and pull my method signatures around for various reasons. So already taking out a lot of the donkey work. Now, a lot of the refactorings that I would use um, are about essentially extracting bits of code into things with names. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Let's say, for example, we want to explain what that means. What is that condition? We could introduce a local variable and give it a name like is right. Let's rerun our tests. Or let's say we've got lots of instances of n, so lots of duplication, and we want to explain also what does n mean. It's some kind of magic value there. Um, so we could introduce a constant. Let's call it north. And we're going to replace everywhere that currently references that literal value n. We're going to replace that with a reference to the north constant. OK, uh, rerun our tests. And what if, for some reason, we wanted 
some literal value or some expression to be passed in uh, to a method rather than being initialized inside the method, we could introduce a parameter. Let's call that parameter east. Again, we can replace all the references to um, e with east. And what this is going to do, if I execute this now, you'll see in a second, um, is it introduces a new parameter. It replaces all references to that literal value with references to the parameter. And in the client code, it passes the literal value in. Now, I mostly use introduce parameter um, in order to introduce dependency injection. So if I see an object being created inside a method and I'm thinking, oh, I'd like that object to be passed in from the outside, then I would use introduce parameter to achieve that very, very easily. And finally, what about fields? So we can do constants. We can also do fields. Let's say, for example, we wanted S to become... This, of course, from a design point of view, makes no sense, but just to demonstrate, if we wanted to introduce a field for that, and let's call that field south. And again, we have the option to replace all references to S with south. And we also get the option as to where are we going to initialize this field in the declaration, in the constructor, or right here in this method. Let's do it in the constructor. Seems like a sensible place. And rerun our tests. So it does the whole thing, the complete refactoring for us and gets us back to working code in a single step. You'll notice that I'm not editing the code, I'm letting the tool do all the work for me. And there's our field south being initialized inside the constructor as we requested. So we can extract bits of code, literal values or expressions into um, local variables, into fields, into constants, if that's a suitable medium for it so that we can name them, so we can essentially make them self-describing, and also so that we can remove duplication. In the same way, for example, we, we removed all the duplicate ends and replaced that with a reference to a single constant. So all sorts of good reasons for that. And we can also do it the other way around. We can take something um, that we want, that, that maybe we want to, to have it in place, in line, if you like, so if we wanted to inline this constant, so replace all references to the north constant with the actual value of north, we can use inline field there. And it will remove all of them. And optionally, we can keep that or we can get rid of it if it's not being referenced anywhere. Off we go. So now the n is back. And wherever we were referring to north, that constant, we're now referring to n again. So, inlining is kind of the opposite of extracting code. Um, it takes the implementation of that code and puts it where the reference is. And optionally, we can then get rid of the thing that we're referencing, the, the field or the method or the constant or whatever it is. And, and I would often use inlining to bring a bunch of code into a single sort of blob so that then I can, from different methods, for example, so that then I can redistribute it, extract it into a different kind of design, remodularize it in a different way. Um, so I find that a, a kind of a stepping stone to a lot of refactorings that are very useful. So that's most of the stuff that we can extract. We're going to see a, a couple more as we go. Um, now, the refactoring process is a little bit like chess in the sense that you can't just be thinking about the move you're about to make. You need to be thinking several moves ahead. And I have a plan for this design. There's something bugging me about my design here relating to the username and password and this code here. I don't, I don't believe this code belongs where it is. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to get that code into its own class. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to do it as a sequence of three refactorings that will get me closer to that point, get me to the, the point where I have a class that has a username and a password that authenticates that user. Um, first of all, I'm going to use a refactoring called introduce parameter object. And what we're going to do, what this will do is it will take the parameters that we select, in this case, username and password. It will create a new class with those parameters of fields of that class. And it will pass in an instance of this new class, this user, into the method instead of username and password, the separate values. Two reasons you might want to do this. First reason is, if you have a method with a long list of parameters, 
you might want to then say, well, let's introduce a parameter object so that we're only passing in one thing. And if we need to add more information that that method uses, we can add it as a field of that object rather than adding another parameter and breaking the signature, breaking all the client code. Um, the other reason we're gonna, we might do it is something I'm about to demonstrate. So let's do this. Let's introduce this parameter object user. Let's rerun our tests there. And you'll see what it's done is it's now passing in a user and it's using the fields of user instead of those parameter values. And if you look inside our test code, what it's actually doing is it's initializing this user here with the, uh, with the username and password. Um, so it's not null, it can't be null. So it does it all in one step so that our code compiles and runs and the tests all pass. So that's super, that's step number one. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get this code on its own. It doesn't belong in the Go method. It's doing something else. It's not driving the rover. It's doing something else. So I'm going to extract a method. And let's call this method authenticate. And you'll see that the tool has picked up that in order for this to work, we need to pass the user in as a parameter because it's it, it exists before this block of code. Similarly, if we were initializing or changing any objects or data inside this block of code that's referenced afterwards that would then need to become a return value of this method but in that in this particular example that is not the case so it's void okay let's do that lovely and let's run our tests so we now have an authenticate method if we take a look inside its implementation that is acting on this user object so what we have here is an example of Feature Envy. This is a method that is not about the Mars rover, it's about the user. So this method is in the wrong class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this instance method to user. And you'll see because it's private, that's not going to work. So the tool knows in order to not break the code, it's going to have to raise the visibility of that authenticate method when it moves it to user. So Let's refactor that and it's going to open it. So you see now we've got this, this user class that has the authenticate method on it. Let's rerun our tests. And because now user is doing the work, we don't need these getters anymore. We don't need to expose this internal information. So we can inline these getters. Let's rerun our tests all about the discipline it's all about the discipline jason right and again we can inline get password and it will remove the original method declaration and rerun our tests so now authenticate is essentially encapsulated we don't know what information it's using to do that all the mars rover knows is that it can tell the user to authenticate that's all it needs to know now. So that's often why I will use introduce parameter object it is in order to discover types of objects. So in my style of TDD, quite often, before I've even thought about declaring any classes, I'll be writing the implementation code that I'm testing as methods inside the test fixture so that I can see, okay, it does this and therefore it requires these parameters. It requires this information to do that job and that essentially is the basis of, of, of that's one half of object design which is what is this object's responsibility and therefore what does it need to know in order to do that job so then you look at the parameters and you go okay some of those parameters could become fields of a new class so we introduce a parameter object then we move that method from inside the test fixture to this new class. So essentially we discover, oh, we've got a class that does this and therefore requires these fields or requires this information. So I often use it as, as, as a, a tool for object discovery and a very useful tool as well. But also I use it quite often um, to fix long parameter lists and other stuff, other boring stuff too. Um, and I use move instance method a lot. Moving the responsibilities around between our modules is a big part of the sort of the, the ongoing design process, figuring out where this code really belongs. So I use move, move instance method rather a lot. So there you go. There's a bunch of refactorings relating to extracting things, 
moving things around. We can, of course, also move classes. If I wanted to move, let's say I create a new, a new package here. Let's call it com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.com.
but it's also a single step to undo it, usually, um, which means um, it's pretty easy to get back to something as well if you want to, so you can experiment relatively safely. Um, of course, if you're using version control, that's ultimate undoability, and I'm not suggesting that undo will get you all the way back. I've tried it on this one, and it, it, it kind of stalls halfway through. There's, a, there's a, an action it can't undo, so that's why you need version control. But for sort of the immediate future and past of actions you performed, refactorings you've done, a, a single step undo is very useful. The reason I've undone that is because I want to finish by demonstrating a, a set of refactorings that are related. Um, let's say for whatever reason we wanted to introduce a superclass for this. We can use extract superclass. Now, I want the superclass to have a go method on it, and I want it to not be abstract for some bizarre reason. And if it's not abstract, that means because this method references these fields, you can see the automated refactoring dialog is sort of painting them red, saying, no, 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 no. If you do that by itself, it's going to break the code because it needs to see those fields. They can't be in the subclass. So I'm going to move those into our superclass as well. And that gives us a complete implementation there. What that's going to do is going to introduce, oh, let's give it a proper name, like vehicle. And if we refactor that, again, it will look for usages. There aren't any, but if it finds some that it could replace with references to vehicle, it will do that automatically for us if we want. Let's rerun our test. You'll see now that Mars Rover really basically is just a constructor and a couple of getters there. That's all it is. Um, if we take a look inside our vehicle base class there, there's all of our implementation for Go and all the fields and etc. etc. So we can introduce um, inheritance relatively simply using this tool. Um, we can also move members between levels in the class hierarchy. So for example, if we thought, no, actually the Go method, the implementation of the Go method belongs in Mars Rover, we can push that member down and make this one here in our class abstract. So it doesn't need to access these, these fields. Make it abstract in the um, in the base class. Let's perform that refactoring. There it goes. And let's rerun our tests. So now you can see that in vehicle, Go is an abstract method. And it's we override it. We implement it there inside our Mars rover. And we can do the reverse. We can pull members up from a subclass into a base class. So let's pull the Go method back up just for jolly. Okay, and rerun our test. So it's gone now from Mars Rover. And it's back in the base class. So class hierarchies in terms of refactoring and, and extracting base classes and moving members between levels in the hierarchy, pretty straightforward. Having said all of that, from a design point of view, we tend to find that class hierarchies, that inheritance, implementation inheritance, is undesirable. So if you're looking at code that has implementation inheritance, there's a number of ways that we can deal with this. One is a refactoring called flatten hierarchy. Let's take a look at that. If we wanted to flatten this hierarchy, what we can do is we can inline vehicle into Mars rover, hopefully. Let's see if we can, if it will let us do that. Inline the superclass. And we can't. Um, because there are usages of methods that are not inherited from a superclass or interface. So again, it's telling us here, you can't do that. Um, there are usages of its methods not inherited from a superclass or interface. Not quite sure what that means. Okay, we're abandoning that one. Um, I did it before, but I think I must have done something slightly differently. So it worked before, but now it doesn't work. Uh, it won't let me do it, but it is protecting me from attempting to do that. Um, so we can't, if in a normal circumstance, if this was not the case, um, I am wondering why it won't do that. Let's try it from here. Aha! I've done it the one, that's what I did. I did it the wrong way around. I don't use this one very often, I must stress. So let's refactor that and remove vehicle. Off it goes. And ha, 
an odd kind of thing happened there. It's broken the code. Now, this will happen occasionally. None of these tools are perfect. And you will hear people say, misguided people, in my opinion, say, ah, well, if you're working on legacy code and you've got no unit tests, as long as you use the automated refactorings, that's fine, that's safe, because they are guaranteed not to break your code. This, unfortunately, is not the case. Um, there we go. Why it did that, I do not know. Easily fixed. Easily fixed, but not quite on the money there for that one. Um, so we can we can flatten a hierarchy by inlining base classes. Watch yourself on that refactoring. Um, but there's something else we can do as well. Let's undo all of this. There's another way that we can deal with this problem. Um, rather than using implementation inheritance, we can use containment and delegation instead. So in, we would have an instance of our vehicle contained inside Mars Rover and our Go method would delegate to the Go method on our instance of vehicle. Now, in order for this to work, we have to be able to create an instance of vehicle. Let's just take a look at the vehicle class. At the moment, we can't do that because it's abstract. So let's fix that. Rerun our tests. There we go. And back to our Mars Rover. So we have a, a rather natty refactoring here called replace inheritance with delegation. And when we do this, it's going to say, well, we want to delegate the go method from Mars Rover to vehicle. It's going to create a field called vehicle, which it will instantiate. So it's not null. And if we refactor that and rerun our tests, that inheritance hierarchy has disappeared now. So instead of inheriting from a vehicle, it's actually delegating to an instance of vehicle. So quite a useful refactoring, particularly if you've got code which has got these sort of nasty deep um, inheritance hierarchies. So all sorts of ways of flattening those or turning them to something that's a bit more a bit more dynamic, a bit easier to maintain, like this, for example. Um, so there you go. There's a bunch of automated refactorings um, that are available in IntelliJ. Many of these are also available in Eclipse. Other tools are available, um, just to be clear. Um, but the, the refactoring menu in, in IntelliJ is particularly full-featured. And that's because it, this is a tool that's been around for a long time. So it's very well developed. You'll see there are a bunch of refactorings that are specific to Java as well. So there's more, more here than we've got time to look at. But I've shown you the ones essentially that I would use the most often. Um, and hopefully that gives you some ideas about how you might be able to use these tools or whether you would like to use these tools at all. Um, as I said, I do a lot of refactoring, so I find them invaluable. Um, so that's the automated refactorings in IntelliJ. More videos coming soon. If you're interested, ring the bell for notifications or subscribe to this channel or do both. Ring the bell and subscribe. More Java videos coming in the near future.